Students, I'd like to talk to you a little bit on this particular video about continuous growth as compared to regular annual growth or hourly growth. I'm going to do a few different examples for you. One on interest, one on decay, and then a third regular doubling of a growth population, in this case of a bacteria population. Now, this videotape is going to be a little bit different than most tapes. Uh, as many of you know, I'm doing my floors this weekend, and my house has been basically in a state of demolition. You'll notice the set's a little differently to different today because I'm being filmed at my daughter's house. So once again, you hear my granddaughter in the background, you hear her dogs. My dog is actually pretty well behaved today, so you won't hear her. But at any rate, it's not necessarily up to the usual quality, but I felt it was important to get this out to you and on your... Um, your Blackboard program so that you could get a look at it before you have to turn in the homework next week. And it is game day after all, so go game. Club. The key concept when we're talking about continuous compounding is that you must remember that if we have a simple growth rate of r, then e to the r power yields the corresponding factor that yields that corresponding, that simple growth rate. That factor actually contains the rate with continuous compounding. Let's just look at an example to make this more simple. Now, if we have a bank account that pays 0.05% simple interest, in the past we've talked about how to actually calculate what that interest rate would be and what that growth factor would be if you had daily compounding, quarterly compounding, etc. Well, with E, we can figure out the the continuous compounding rate much more quickly than we can those other versions, much more simply. In this case, we'll just take e to the 0.05 power and the growth factor on that bank account becomes 1.05127, which means that the bank account, after continuously compounding, is actually paying 5.127%. That 0.127 extra is what you receive because of that continuous compounding. Now, remember that this is reversible. Let's say that you knew that you had an account that paid 5.127% after all the compounding. That means that e to that r power, remember, equals that factor. In this case, to solve for both sides of the equation, all I'm going to do is take the log of both sides of the equation. When that happens, remember, the r moves down in front, and I have r times the natural log of e. But the natural log of e is just 1, so I have 1r equals, on the right side I have the natural log of 1.0527. Now, I put in exactly what was typed here, not the rounded version that I put in before. So I want you to, or excuse me, I put in this rounded version of our previous answer, which means I don't come up with exactly 5%, but that you can see that it is very, very close to 5%. So, in, just to summarize here, the second piece of this puzzle, if we knew that this was the compounded rate or actually the compounded factor, and I take the log of it, what I get is the simple interest rate, approximately 5% that the account was paying. When we talk about interest rates, typically that interest is occurring at one specific point in time, like at the end of every day or at the end of every quarter. There are many times where it's more appropriate to talk about a continuous growth that's occurring. Uh, let's look at just such an example. In this case, I've got a population of a city that in the year 2000 was 100,000 people. Eight years later, in the year 2008, it had grown to 120,000. And what I'd like to find is the continuous growth rate that is continuing throughout that entire period. <clears throat> now, I would also like to find what percentage the city grew by during that year, during each year actually. And I'm assuming in both cases that that growth rate was continuous throughout the eight-year period. Finally, I'm going to assume that that growth rate continues on past those eight years, and I would like to predict the population in the year 2020, assuming again that that growth rate did continue to that point in time. 
Now, here's our basic formula for growth that we've been using all along. In this case, my population, given t number of years, would be equal to the initial population times my growth factor to the t power. For this particular example, I know that my initial population was 100,000. Now, in this case, what we're saying is that the population after 8 years equals my initial population of 100,000 times f to the 8th power. And I know that at that point in time, it is equal to a population of 120,000. And what I'd like to do now is divide both sides of this equation by 100,000. If I divide both sides of the equation by 100,000, on this side it cancels, and I know that f to the 8 equals 1.2. Now frankly, at some point here, what I'd really like you folks to be able to see is when you see this question, you just note that that population of 120,000 was 1 1.2 times as big as the population was back in the year 2000. So after 8 times, or 8 years of that whatever that growth was, that growth factor being applied, after eight times that it's been applied, it equals a population that's 1.2 times as big. So f to the eighth merely equals 1.2. Now to solve for this, I will take the eighth root of both sides of my equation, and when I do that, the eighth root is 1.02305. So, in this case, the yearly growth rate, if I put it in percent form, is actually 2.305%. Now, let's talk about the continuous growth that's actually occurring during this period in time. The population starts with that same initial value, and my new growth rate I've inserted into this equation of the 1.02305 to the t power. Again, this is just my basic equation with the initial value, my factor substituted in. Now, let's compare this to the population with the continuous factor. I want you to notice that instead of f, the continuous version has e to the r. But these are the same equation, folks, because e to the r equals that f. In this case, I know that e to the r actually must equal my continuous growth rate, which you'll recall is 0, 02305. Now, to solve this equation, I'm going to do it a little bit differently, but I've shown you this in the past. I'm going to take the natural log of both sides. When I do that, on this side, my r moves down in front, and I have r times the natural log of e. But since the natural log of E is just 1, I'm really left with just R on the left side of my equation. Putting this in my calculator, the natural log of this growth rate, what I get is this decimal. Converting it to a percent, I get this. So what's happening on this particular problem is the city is actually growing continuously at an annual rate of 2.279%, which results, after all that compounding has taken place, in a yearly growth rate, you'll recall, of 2.305%. And recall, during growth, the compounded rate is always bigger than the growth rate before the compounding occurred, or if you prefer, the simple rate. Now, this time, to go ahead and talk about the continuous example, notice that I've put my base population, my initial population of 100,000, times e, I now know the power of e, remember? 0 0.02279 to the t power. Remembering, once again, that this e to that power is equal to the growth factor that I found when I did the annual growth rate. Now, let's go ahead and predict what the population will be in the 20th year. I'm going to go ahead and use this continuous growth uh, formula that I have, and I will merely substitute for t the value 20, because in the year 2020, 20 years of growth have occurred, and plugging that into my calculator, I find a population of 157,744. Now, let's go ahead and go back to my original equation, which you'll recall earlier was up here. This is my annual growth, 
if I plug a 20 into this equation, I hopefully will find the same population in the year 2020. So here's where I've done that. I put in a 20 into the formula, substitute a 20 in for the power, and yes, once again, I find the identical population. Frankly, that's a good check. You can always check those equations by plugging in a number and ensuring that those rates or those populations at the end of that period of time are indeed identical. I'd like to talk about a decay example again. Now decay again usually happens continuously rather than annually or hourly the ways that we've been looking at it in the past. Let's go ahead and look at this as a continuous example. In this case, I know that the half-life of a given substance is 25 years. I want to find both the annual decay rate and the rate at which it is continuously decaying during that 25-year period. Now in this case, what I'm hoping that you're seeing is that if I apply that decay factor 25 times, the amount that it decayed by is one-half. That's the, what a half-life means after all, folks. But if you're not sure about exactly how to do this, then let's back it off for a second and let's pretend that we have a hundred of whatever this item is that's decaying. So, using my formula, I start with a hundred and I apply that decay factor 25 times and I know that after 25 times, half of it's gone, so I'm left with 50. I can now solve this equation by first dividing both sides of my equation by 100. On the left, the 100's cancel, and I have f to the 25. And on the right, 100 divided by 50, or 50 divided by 100, excuse me, simply reduces to 1 half. So again, you can look at it the same. You can either see it instantly, or you can apply a number and solve the equation out the long way if you prefer. You can always just substitute some individual number in. It won't make a difference what number you pick. I chose to use 100 here because it's easier. But I end up with the same conclusion, that after 25 years of applying the decay factor, the amount remaining is 1 half. Now let's solve my equation. I'm going to take the 25th root of both sides of my equation. Doing that, the 25th root of 1 half results in 0.97265. Now, remember that if no decay occurs, this is actually, a, there's 100% remaining the next year of what was there the previous year since none of it decayed. But in this case, what I found is that 97% approximately is left the remaining year. Well, subtracting that from 100% tells me that roughly 3% or roughly 2.735% is the rate that it's decaying at. Now, let's talk about continuous decay. Remember, of course, that that e to that power must equal your decay factor. Again, to solve this, I'm going to go ahead and take the natural log of both sides and the natural log of 0.097265 equals this percentage. Now once again, one of the advantages to using these continuous decay problems is it's much simpler to do these actual calculations. In this case, I want you to also notice that it just comes out as negative. That tells me right away it's a negative decay rate. It's decaying, rather. In this case, it's decaying at a rate of 2.773. Now again, you're going to notice that that actual annual decay rate is a little bit different than the yearly decay rate. I'm sorry, the continuous decay rate is differently than the yearly decay rate. And the reason for that is because of the compound. Let's do our third and final example. In this case, I have a bacteria colony that doubles in size every five hours. I want to find the hourly decay, or excuse me, the hourly growth rate and the continuous rate of growth that would result in that hourly growth rate. In this case, again, I'm really hoping, folks, that you're going to see that once that factor has been applied five times, I end up with double or two times or a factor of two of what I had to begin with. Once again, to solve this, all I'm simply going to have to do is take the fifth root of both sides. If you don't see that, though, again, I can just substitute in a very similar way as I did the last problem. Let's assume that my beginning the total bacteria count is equal to 100 and I'm going to multiply that by some factor however many 
times, in this case, however many hours. In this case, I did tell you that after five hours, and I can substitute my five right into my equation, that the number of bacteria after five hours was 200. Now let's again solve for F. I could divide both sides by 100, cancel out my 100s, and again, I have F to the 5 equals 200. Again, you can simply substitute any beginning number you wish. In percents, it's almost always easier to substitute 100, so I've done so in this case. But the point again was that once that factor has been applied five times, once that population is doubled, you know that this must equal a 2. And in my ideal world, you could have done that way back in the first step when I tried to lead you down that path. Hopefully you were with me. But if not, you've gone through the equation, worked it out the long way, and gotten to the same point. At this point, I will take the fifth root of both sides of my equation. In this case, my root and power cancel, and I have F equals 1.14870 as my growth factor. Now, that also means that my hourly growth rate, if I look at just the decimal portion, would be 14.870. Now remember, when I'm doing the continuous rate, that e to the r equals that growth factor. And now all I have to do is solve this equation for r, and I will do that by taking the natural log of both sides. Again, I'll move the r down in front, and I'll have r times the natural log of e, and the natural log of e is 1, so I just have 1r or r. And if I take the natural log of this growth rate, then, or excuse me, of this growth factor, then I get the growth rate. So this bacteria is actually growing at a rate of 13.863% continuously, which results in an hourly growth rate, once you've done all the compounding, of 14.87%. Now let's take a look here one more time. I want to make this one point again. My basic equation, if I just did it as an hourly growth the way we have in the past, I would say the bacteria count equals my initial amount of 100 bacteria each, or excuse me, in the colony, times my hourly growth factor to the t power. If I look at my continuous growth, I start off with 100 times e to my continuous growth rate to the t power. If you plug 2 into both of these equations, you had better find out both equations end up with exactly 200 bacteria after the two hours have elapsed. Now, this number will only be exact if you've stored these numbers back to infinity in your calculator. If you have not stored these two numbers, you won't get exactly 200, but a very close representation of that 200.